well and I want to thank you and Masab and the other organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you today. I'm, I really wish that we could see each other in person, but we're, we're stuck over Zoom as we have been for the past year. So I will do my best uh, under the circumstances. So um, thank you so much for, for the really nice introduction. And I was asked to talk uh, not just about some of the work that I'm doing, but also how did I get here? What was, was kind of my background? And so I thought I would start off with, uh, with a slide. So uh, telling you a little bit about my career history. So I, let me switch to laser pointer. So I was born here in, in Southern Germany, but uh, I, I, uh, my, I moved to the United States to a very cold place, Minnesota, when I was about two years old. And there I became very interested in, oh, I really liked uh, like nature shows, I really liked philosophy, and I just became very fascinated with how the brain works. And I had got this idea into my mind that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And so I had the opportunity actually when I was in high school. So uh, since, since I was a bit of a dorky kid, I, this is how I spent my summers in high school, uh, volunteering my time at this neurosurgery research laboratory. And they did basic research actually. And I found that actually that's something that I really like to do. And so I went on to, uh, to focus on studying neuroscience uh, uh, in college at Southern California. Um, then went to, uh, to pursue my PhD in San Francisco, uh, where I got into developmental biology. I was very influenced by my, uh, my uh, undergraduate advisor, who was a developmental biologist, um, and then shifted gears a little bit. And for my postdoc, um, as, uh, as Mahmoud was uh, explaining in his very nice introduction, I moved towards something that I hoped would be a little bit more clinically relevant, a little more, more relevant for human disease. So I had the opportunity to work on human pluripotent stem cells. And that's where I developed this system uh, that I'll tell you about today um, and how I've started um, expanding on those initial discoveries and, and trying to develop this novel system for studying obesity within my own group at the University of Cambridge. So it's really a journey that started by just me being a, a curious and, and kind of a dorky kid um, and just pursuing my interests and then good things kind of, uh, kind of came from that. And so why, why am I going on this, this long trajectory and, and pursuing these studies? Well, it's really because I think I want to leave the world a, a better place than what I found it. And I want to study something that is going to have an impact on a lot of people. This is why I'm really interested in this problem of obesity. So if we look at the just the incidence of obesity, which is defined as having a body mass index of 30 or higher, um, there are in, in the United States and in Western countries, but also kind of in, in Northern Africa and in the Middle East, uh, the, the rates of obesity are really surprisingly high. And there are some countries in the world that are still relatively unaffected, but I think uh, things are catching up. So if we look at the incidence of overweight uh, children, this is just young children aged uh, two to four um, who are already uh, showing signs of likely obesity later in life, um, we see that the world is, is, is catching up. And if we look just at the United States as a case study over time, uh, obesity used to be quite rare, right? So if we only go back about 90 years, um, there's very few people actually um, that fell into this, this category of having a high BMI. But rates have rapidly increased and are continuing to do so. So over well over a third of US adults are now overweight and obese. And this is concerning because there's all of these comorbid, comorbidities that you see with obesity, such as type 2 diabetes, certain types of cancer, heart disease and stroke, and perhaps even dementia. And this is a problem because there's no good way to actually address this issue. You can tell people to exercise and eat less, but we are biologically programmed to find food delicious. And this makes it very difficult for people to actually, uh, myself included, to actually stick to uh, a, a diet regime. And over time, most people will go back to their body weight set point. So behavioral change is an important aspect of what we should be doing, but I don't think kind of at the population level, it's going to, um, it, it's going to adequately address this obesity epidemic. 
So on the other hand, there's bariatric surgery, which is a very severe intervention, but it can have these dramatically, uh, dramatically beneficial effects at reducing body weight and food intake. So the dream is to really um, identify compounds there are existing drugs that reduce food intake and can maintain a lower body weight at a steady state, but the effects are kind of modest. So the ideal effect would be to increase the efficacy of those drugs and mimic the effects of bariatric surgery without actually having to do the surgery. So how can we do that? So one good way to understand this is to look at the genetics of obesity. And so this is a representation from uh, a figure from uh, from from Lock et al. in 2015, a really nice uh, a really nice study looking at the genetics of obesity, and it's clear that the, the predominant signal is coming from the nervous system. So obesity really is high, highly heritable. It's not due to moral inferior, inferiority. It's because our genes are telling us to eat, and those genes are exerting the role in the brain. Um, and specifically, if we look across the brain there are regions such as the hypothalamus, which are absolutely critical for the long-term regulation of energy balance. So this is probably where these genes are exerting a lot of their effect. And one of the cell populations within the hypothalamus, uh, just cartooned here in green, are these pro-opium melanocortin or POMC neurons. So these cells um, secrete a neuropeptide that's derived from POMC called melanocyte stimulating hormone or MSH, um, and that binds to the downstream receptor on neurons that inhibit food intake. Uh, this receptor is known as the melanocortin-4 or MC4R. Uh, and mutations in either the POMC gene or the MC4R gene are sufficient to cause severe early onset monogenic obesity in both mice and in humans. In fact, mutations in MC4R are the single most common monogenic cause of human obesity. So we know that the system must be really important in regulating food intake. There's another system that, uh, that uh, many of you um, may, may know about called the, the leptin melanocortin system, right? So leptin is a hormone that's produced by your fat cells that then travels to the brain. And there are cell populations within the brain, including these POMC neurons that sense the leptin by the leptin receptor and regulates the activity of these cells. So if we don't receive the leptin signal, the brain interprets that as we're starving, we need to eat more. And that leads to severe hyperphagia, so overeating and obesity in humans. But if you have a deficiency of leptin, you can just replace the leptin that's missing and completely normalize body weight. So this tells us the system is really critical for body weight regulation. So our hypothesis in our group is that there's that there are other mechanisms that um, other, whether they be genetic or environmental that are playing a role in contributing to obesity by acting on this circuit. So in our laboratory, we're really interested in these pro melanocortin or POMC neurons because we, can, uh, we know that they're very transcriptionally distinct. We know that they're very biologically relevant um, as we've just described, and also we can produce these cells in culture, as, as I'm about to describe. So uh, for most of the talk, I'll be uh, telling you about these, these POMC or pro opium melanocortin neurons. Um, and in general, the approach of my group is that if we're going to have an impact, if we're really going to understand how to identify new mechanisms that contribute to obesity, maybe identify new drugs, that can act on those mechanisms. We want to leverage all of these new tools, these resources and technologies, just CRISPR-Cas9, high throughput screening, and all this sequencing data that's, uh, that's being generated from human populations. And historically, uh, we've been able to use animal models and uh, develop some translational insights that way. But what we'd like to do is accelerate that process by combining this with human stem cell derived neurons. So this system has several advantages. Um, we can deconstruct the complexity that exists in vitro, uh, in vivo, and just have an in vitro model where we can study each of these cell populations uh, in isolation. And since we can make large numbers of these cells, this allows us to do things like genetic screens or drug screens to really, um, to really uh, understand how our genes contributing to neural dysfunction and how can we rescue dysfunction um, by drugs. So 
the approach for doing this is to work with human pluripotent stem cells. Um, and so there's multiple sources of these. These can be derived um, from human embryos, from pre-implantation, very, very early in development embryos, or can be reprogrammed from somatic cells um, to make induced pluripotent stem cells. So these can be propagated uh, in the pluripotent state in vitro. Um, and our aim is to encourage their differentiation from a pluripotent state into the relevant cell population, which is the hypothalamus, which we know from developmental biology is this anterior and ventral brain region. So how can we, how can we generate that? Um, I'm gonna condense many years of work into one slide. We got help from many, uh, many um, other groups in this, including Yoshiki Sasai and Lorenz Studer. Uh, so really standing on the shoulders of giants to do this, but uh, essentially we found a directed differentiation protocol to guide the differentiation of these cells from the pluripotent state to a neural lineage, to a forebrain lineage, which we then ventralized with small molecule agonists of the sonic hedgehog pathway, which we then encouraged to give rise to these hypothalamic neurons, which include POMC or pro melanocortin neurons. And we did this by... Um, by kind of systematically exploring different combinations, concentrations, um, and timing of, of different factors. So um, by doing this, I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. We we're able to identify a combination that gave us, uh, that gave us hypothalamic neurons and we confirmed their identity by immunostaining uh, and by performing um, also uh, single cell sequencing to confirm the, the generation of of POMC neurons, as well as other cell populations that are found either exclusively in the hypothalamus or are highly enriched in the hypothalamus. This is great. We're very excited about all of this. And um, we also went on to characterize these cells a little bit more, more thoroughly. So we see that um, over time, uh, if we mature these cells, they'll be spontaneously active. Um, they'll show in, in, in induced activity by calcium imaging in response to biologically relevant stimuli, such as serotonin in this case. And if we zoom in on these cells and look at them a little bit more closely, we see that they, that if we actually stain for POMC, it's not uniformly expressed within the cell, but it's found in these, these little puncta, these little vesicle-like puncta. And this is what you see in cells that are taking neuropeptides and package, packaging them into dense core vesicles for release. And uh, we went on to confirm this by electron microscopy as well. Um, but one thing that we're really uh, interested in is their production of MSH. So just to remind you, within the brain, these POMC neurons, the way they exert their activity is that they take the, the POMC gene and they process it into this MSH peptide. And that's actually what's acting on these downstream neurons. So we wondered in our human stem cell derived POMC system, could we see processing to this MSH peptide? Um, because that obviously would be very functionally relevant. So here I'm showing you just a schematic diagram of the POMC gene. Um, here's the, 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 the signal peptide. And in blue, these are all these dibasic cleavage site, uh, sites where um, POMC can be cut by different enzymes, these prohormone convertase enzymes that slice it up into these different bioactive peptides. So here I've just highlighted in green here, these different uh, potential bioactive peptides. The one that's been extensively studied is this one here known as alpha MSH. Um, this has been extensively studied because it's very evolutionarily conserved. It's produced in um, mice and rats and humans and, and, and other species as well. And it comes in two flavors. Um, it has a, uh, a C-terminal amidation, but it can also have this N-terminal acetylation. So this is known as uh, acetylated or alpha MSH, and it comes in this desacetyl version as well. There's also been some studies suggesting that there's this other species called beta MSH. Um, this is seen in many species, but not in mice and rats. So it was a little controversial whether this even exists in humans and whether it plays an important role in body weight regulation or not. And there's been some studies that suggest that actually it probably is playing an important role. These are genetic studies where there were families that were shown to have uh, point mutations in beta MSH. So either in this very conserved tyrosine residue or in, a, in the dibasic cleavage site itself. And those individuals at very young ages 
uh, went on to be much heavier um, than, than expected, suggesting that maybe beta MSH actually is playing this important role, but it had never really been directly experimentally validated. So to do that, um, my, my colleagues and I did uh, quantitative mass spectroscopy. So the way that we did this is we had our cultures of, of human hypothalamic neurons, which included the POMC neurons. We could either stimulate these cells or not, and then collect either the supernatant or the cell pellet, extract the peptides, and then, and then uh, look by liquid, chromatog liquid chromatography tandem mass spectroscopy um, for different peptides, including these species of MSH peptides. And what we found is that not only did we see uh, uh, alpha MSH, but we also found um, beta MSH, we were very pleased to see, um, as well as beta endorphin, which is, which is uh, another important POMC derived peptide that I'm not going to talk about very much. So what we wanted to know is, is this just an artifact of our in vitro culture system, or can we actually find evidence that beta MSH is produced in vivo. So to do that, we took advantage of the fact that Cambridge has a brain bank. So we're getting, uh, you know, every week we'll get a couple of, of fresh brains. So um, they'll be, we'll get them maybe a day or so after the individual has passed away. And um, with the help of a neuroanatomist, we dissected out regions of the hypothalamus. So here the paraventricular nucleus or the medial basal hypothalamus, which should contain either the processes or cell bodies of POMC neurons. And we then took them through the same process of, uh, of, of mass spectrometry and were able to identify exactly the same sequences of neuropeptide in, uh, in these primary human brain samples as we could find in our cultured cells. So then, what we really want to know is how much of this are we really seeing? And that's, it's all well and good that we can see some, but maybe the predominant species is actually this desazetyl alpha MSH. So how much of this beta MSH are we really seeing? And to make a long story short, we we're actually surprised to see about the same amount of beta MSH as this desazetyl alpha MSH. So this really proves that this is produced um, in our cultures, it's also produced in the brain. So if we look in the brain, the ratios are almost exactly the same. And the thing that was actually quite surprising is this alpha MSH, this is what the textbooks say is the most important species for regulating food intake um, because its production, if you inject it into the brain, it suppresses food intake and it suppresses body weight. Um, that this species is um, was, was very difficult to even detect in our culture system was also produced in very low levels in the primary human brain. So overall, we are really surprised and delighted by these results because it suggests that actually we need to uh, reframe our thinking a little bit about what POMC derived peptides that are really central in the regulation of food intake are produced in the human brain and are active in the human brain. So we also wanted to take advantage of the fact that we have a, um, that we have a live cell system. And this allows us to do things that you can't do in a postmortem brain and it, that you can't really do very easily um, in animal models because you just can't get large enough quantities of, these, of, of the cells to do these studies very easily. So we wanted to know, are our neurons responding to biologically important factors like the hormone leptin? So to, to uh, just uh, show you a schematic of this system, um, here are, here's our POMC neurons that are producing some amount of MSH under baseline conditions. Um, so if we um, then normalize the production of these different species of POMC derived peptides um, to these, this baseline condition, we can then ask, does adding uh, does adding a hormone like leptin to our culture system, which we know from in vivo studies that leptin should increase the production of MSH from POMC, does that now change uh, the production of MSH in our culture system as well? And indeed that was the case. So this was a very reproducible result and a very statistically significant result um, that in response to leptin, including these very low levels of very biologically um, relevant concentrations of leptin, we're able to, um, to get close to a 50% increase 
in the amount of MSH that's produced. So this is important because we think that the amount of these neuropeptides that are produced are kind of setting the tone of how hungry you are, what your food intake is. So if you're increasing the production of a neuropeptide that is suppressing food intake, this could actually affect body weight in the long run. And so we're very interested in, in this question of how is, is MSH tone regulated? So what are the different factors that go into this, this, whole, um, this, this whole machinery that at the end of the day is going to affect how much MSH is seen by the downstream cells that are expressing the melanocortin-4 receptor? So this could happen at the level of the transcription of the POMC gene, the translation of that gene, the processing of it into MSH, and then also the secretion of MSH into the extracellular space. So we could study each of these in theory, but we've chosen to focus uh, initially on the translation of POMC. And that's because um, there's good methods by using immunocytochemistry and high content imaging to, to start to get at this question. And so uh, to do this, we took advantage of the fact that we have this high content imager in our institute. We're very fortunate enough to have this, uh, to have this microscope. So um, this is a confocal microscope, a spinning disc confocal microscope, but you can put a plate of cells in there and designate um, where it should image and it will automatically take confocal stacks across that whole plate if you ask it to. It's quite quick as well. So you can image a whole plate in about half an hour or so. Then you have loads of data that you can mine. Um, so what it will look like is something like this. So we can grow our cells on these, uh, on these special plates that have an optical grade plastic bottom. And uh, across all these images that we're taking, we can, we can get a very nice resolution uh, of our images. And here we're staining in different channels. This is looking at POMC. Um, this is looking at MAP2, uh, a marker of neuronal processes, um, and, and at nuclei. We can stitch all those images together and extract the features that we want. So here's an example of how we can do that to automatically identify the cell bodies of POMC neurons and quantify the amount of POMC that they're expressing. So we can start by taking the MAP2 staining, um, making a mask with that, um, also then taking our, uh, our, our staining for POMC, and then within this mask, we can, we can identify POMC cell bodies. And from each of those cell bodies, um, uh, we can extract now the value of POMC intensity. And the, the advantages of this is we can do this over very large numbers of cells. So um, I'm just showing some pilot data. Uh, we're still in the very early stages of doing this but we can repeat the types of experiments that we did by quantitative mass spectrometry, but now we can do it over, uh, over a much larger number of cells and a much larger number of conditions. So under our control conditions, um, here's, the, here's what a POMC image will look like under our control conditions. Um, and here's a distribution of POMC intensity um, of all of the neurons that we have identified as POMC positive. So this is looking at, uh, at, at over 2000 cells. Here we can add in leptin and what we can see, um, it's a bit difficult to appreciate from a single image, but when you look across a population of cells, we can see this subtle but very statistically significant shift of the population to seeing an increased production of, of, of POMC in response to this hormone leptin. We can, we can of course do this for novel compounds, novel drugs. Um, most of them give a null result, but every so often you'll see a compound that's at least as, as potent, if not more potent than our positive control, which is leptin. So we're very excited about this and thinking of, uh, of developing this into a system to screen for drugs that can increase MSH production, um, which we would then, uh, the plan is that we would then give this to mice and see how does that influence their food intake and their body weight. So um, I just wanted to spend a, a little bit of time telling you about the, um, the other studies that are going on in, in the laboratory. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, and then I want to spend about five minutes or so telling you about a, uh, a, a recent paper, a collaborative paper that came out um, showing how we can kind of combine the, uh, combine the power 
of stem cell biology and differentiation to, to different disease relevant cell types and single cell sequencing to learn about the effect of common genetic variants on, uh, on, on the, the, the function of, of uh, uh, and gene expression and function um, in a cell type specific way. So one thing that we're interested in that I've already talked about is anti-obesity drug discovery. We're also in our group, we're interested in the basic molecular mechanisms of metabolic sensing. So how is it that neurons are, uh, are sensing and responding to these different signals that are, that, that, that are present? Um, we're interested in the um, kind of leveraging the genetics of obesity and, and seeing what cellular phenotypes arise from, uh, from, from genetic perturbations that we can engineer using CRISPR-Cas9. And we're also in, in a kind of a new line of investigation for our group, which I, I won't have time to tell you about today, um, but I'd be happy to, to touch on during the question and answer is shared mechanisms between metabolic and neurodegenerative disease. So I just wanna take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about, um, about uh, the obesity genetic side of things. So um, going back to this idea that most genes that are associated with obesity are enriched within the nervous system, um, and that a lot of these map to the hypothalamus, our hypothesis is that if we can identify genes that are enriched in our culture system in human POMC neurons, um, and we overlap that with genes that are associated with obesity, these would be really good candidate genes for disease modeling or potentially for therapeutic targeting. So maybe we want to develop a drug that will target one of the genes that is misregulated or misexpressed um, in obesity. Um, the other approach that we're taking is a CRISPR screening approach. So a very unbiased way to, to not look at the effect of individual genes, but to look at a, a large number of genes that might be arising from either um, GWAS studies, these genome-wide association studies, or um, from the exome sequencing studies that are, that are being uh, generated in increasingly large numbers. And I think it's a very, very exciting time to be in the field of disease modeling because we're getting all this great genetic data. So here, um, our candidate genes, we, we would select on the basis that they're associated with obesity from these sequencing studies, that we see them in our, um, in our human uh, stem cell derived uh, hypothalamic neurons, and there's, there's another uh, group that we're working with this, that's doing similar work, but from postmortem human tissue. So we'd really like to see um, all of those genes uh, to be expressed. And then the idea is that we would um, uh, have a pool of, uh, of isogenic um, human pluripotent stem cells where we are um, perturbing, perturbing one of these genes. Um, we would do this in a pooled format so that um, we generate a population of cells where, um, where we, we'd have um, mutations that we're introducing in each of these genes of interest in a single pool. Um, and then we, can, then we can take advantage of single cell sequencing and figure out which gene was mutated in which of these cell types. And so then we can begin to map what is the effect of uh, perturbing that gene on, let's say, POMC neurons or on the glial cells that arise in our culture system as well. Um, with the idea that interesting hits, we would then um, uh, nominate for functional follow-up um, for gain of function, loss of function experiments in animal models and in vitro as well. So in just the last few minutes, because I want to leave uh, plenty of time for the question and answer session, I wanna tell you about this study that was recently published, which was a collaboration um, with the groups of John Marioni, Dan Gaffney, and Ali Stegle. And this is really taking this idea of, uh, of pooling stem cells and, and uh, learning about cell type specific biology with single cell sequencing, uh, a really exciting step forward, I think. So here our focus was not hypothalamic neurons, but dopaminergic neurons. Um, and this is because we're hoping to um, maybe gain some insights into Parkinson's disease, but also generally have a model system for looking at the, uh, look, looking at uh, the, the cell type specific effects because this, it's known that this differentiation protocol generates a lot of cellular diversity as well. And here we took advantage also of the fact that we have um, 
really due to the facts of, of, of Dan Gaffney and his colleagues, this collection of induced pluripotent stem cells um, from, uh, from, from many different individuals. They tend to all be of, of uh, British ancestry. Um, but in this case, we were able to take 215 of these genetically distinct stem cell lines and grow them together in pools. Um, so we pooled, uh, we had a total of 17 pools, um, each of us, each of which had about a, a dozen to 20 or so of these cell lines and took this pool rather than a single cell line. We took this pool through this process of differentiation, first uh, floor plate induction, then, uh, then uh, through a maturation of, of, of neurons, uh, uh, kind of targeting the midbrain dopaminergic lineage. And we collect these cells at three different time points at day 11, 30, and day 52. And we performed single cell sequencing. And this was done at the Sanger Institute. They like to do everything at a big scale. So we ended up sequencing over a million of these cells, which is, which is pretty impressive. So we see how uh, the population of cells evolves over time in culture. Um, and at the latest time point, we also did a, a stimulation with, uh, with rotenone to induce oxidative stress so that we could, we could look at changes in response to oxidative stress. And one of the things that we hoped to do with this was to um, map uh, e e EQTLs. And one thing that uh, we, we could, one reason we could do this is that um, uh, there, there have been a number of different protocols now. I'm just describing here Virio, um, which was developed in Ali Stegler's group. Um, but there's a number of these different systems to disentangle from a pool of stem cells, which cell came from which cell line. And this is because there are common variants present in the population. Some of those variants will fall within the transcriptome. And so if you have single cell sequencing data, you can, you can genotype for all of those variants. And since we're looking across uh, you know, thousands and thousands of transcripts, um, you can then um, estimate your genotypes at, at, uh, at those transcripts. And if you know in advance what the, um, what the sequence of the genome is that you're comparing to, or at least the, 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 the exome, the transcriptome, you can then um, pretty accurately map a, a individual cell from a pool back to an individual that uh, contributed to that starting population within the pool. So this is really powerful um, because the pooling approach allows you to get away from a lot of the technical sources of noise that can arise during directed, uh, directed differentiation. Every cell, uh, cell line within the pool is exposed to a very similar environment. So now you can really compare these more subtle genetic differences that can, or subtle phenotypic differences that can arise from having a different genetic background. And so one of the things that we did was to look at um, EQTLs or expression quantitative uh, trait loci. Um, and so uh, if you look at all of these genetic uh, variants um, and you look at gene expression close to that genetic variant, often it will have no effect. And sometimes it actually will have an effect. So depending on what the, um, what the genotype is at the genetic location, uh, gene might be expressed more highly or more lowly. There's also the case where expression is the same, but now when you perturb the cell, for example, if you add rotenone, now you'll see a differential uh, response to the expression of that gene in response to that, uh, to that stimulus. So this is something that, that we were very interested in and wanted to do in this study. And when we looked across uh, all these different cell types and, uh, and time points, we actually found, uh, we found thousands of these, these e-genes, these, uh, these differentially expressed, uh, these, these differently, differentially expressed genes. And uh, this is an example, um, when we do now a co-localization analysis, this is an example of what this looks like. So when we go back to the genomic population where that SNP was, here is uh, an example of one that's, um, that kind of evolves over time. So here is at, at, day, at day 30 and at day 52, this is where we see the signal start to appear. Um, um, you can also see that in response to um, a particular stimulus, in this case, rotenone, you can see um, you can see some of these stimulus-specific EQTLs. So this is really exciting because um, we can now um, 
by, by looking across each of these cell populations, we can find um, not, just, um, uh, not just how does a whole tissue, uh, uh, how, is, how is gene expression affected by, by genetics in a whole tissue, but we can now pull this apart and look in individual cells. How might a different genotype lead to different expression in say um, dopaminergic neurons versus astrocytes? Um, and this allowed us to discover hundreds of uh, hundreds of novel EQTLs that weren't previously known um, from sources such as GTEGs. The other thing that that was really cool and kind of a serendipitous discovery of, of this study is that not every cell line behaved the same way. So here, if we look at differentiation efficiency, in this case, this is the efficiency with which cells uh, differentiated into neurons, uh, we found that some lines did really, really well and some did very poorly. Some gave rise to almost no neurons at all. This had nothing to do with the pool that the cells happened to be grown in. It was pretty evenly distributed there. And uh, we kind of confirmed this by taking some of the same cell lines and growing it across multiple pools. And when we did that, here's, uh, here's it's kind of the differentiation efficiency in, uh, in one replicate versus the other replicate. Um, it was still remained very highly correlated. So there's something intrinsic to that cell line that is causing it to either be a good differentiator or a bad differentiator. So to gain some insight into what that is, uh, we looked at um, existing bulk RNA sequencing data from those cell lines. And we found, uh, if we looked at the outliers, there were some genes that correlated really well uh, with cells that were bad differentiators. We also looked at a separate orthogonal data set. Now this is looking at single cell data from the cells within the pluripotent state. And there's, uh, we didn't have this for each and every cell line, but there's enough overlap that we could, we could find this, this pretty strong correlation with this particular cluster. Um, so if in, in bad differentiating cell lines, there's a lot of a uh, high proportion of the iPS cells within this cluster. And for good differentiators, there, there's almost none in there. And so if we now look at the genes that are expressed within that cluster, we can predict before we do any differentiations at all, we can predict which lines are going to be bad differentiators. So um, there's a, uh, about 13% of the cells in this whole collection that if we wanted to do any work with neurons, we'd advise you to probably stay away from these lines. They're probably not going to work very well in your hands. So that is, uh, I know that uh, that was a little bit quick at the end there, but I really wanted to give a flavor of the different things that, that we're doing in my group and also my, my uh, uh, kind of the meandering journey that I took um, uh, throughout my career to get where I am today. Um, there's a lot of people that really contributed to this work. Um, in particular, um, there's, there's Andrian Yang, who did a lot of the uh, single cell analysis within my group. Um, Peter Kerwan, uh, who's a former postdoc in my group, who's now, um, who's, who's now has a, a job at, in industry. Um, he did a lot of the um, work looking at the, um, the mass spectra mass spec analysis of, of POMC um, processing together with Richard Kay. And I'm really indebted to um, my former advisors, Alex Shear and Kevin Egan, uh, as well as uh, Steve O'Reilly, um, the, the, the director of our institute, who's really made working at the IMS uh, a, a fantastic place to be. Um, and of course, all of our funders who, who've made this work possible. And uh, most importantly, all of you for, for coming and listening. So I'd be really delighted to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. It was such a fantastic talk. And uh, I wish we had more time. I would, I would love to have heard uh, more about the end story about the genomics and uh, transcriptomics that you've been talking about. But yeah, um, thanks a lot. Um, so we do have a question. I do have my own couple of questions. And uh, but let's start with the audience. Uh, there's a question from Needle. Um, he said, does external factors such as stress or psychological factor, such as low self-esteem, trigger the same obesity pathways? Yeah. Um, it does get complicated. The, you know, the brain is a complicated place. And so um, certainly, uh, certainly 
depression, stress. When I'm stressed out, I just want to eat carbohydrates and chocolate, right? Um, so there, there, there definitely is, uh, there is a, a link between those. But if we look at the, you know, if we think about what are the biological levers by which we can intervene to really affect food intake, you know, clearly I think it's important for us to to appreciate that there are um, that there are psychological factors and things uh, things at play as well. But if we want to really have an effect, kind of at the level of a whole population, just appreciating that obesity is so incredibly prevalent and is becoming more so. I think we need to do something about it. And I think the at least the approach that 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 I'm taking is trying to identify those biological levers that are universal, that are present in everybody. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are you know, more basic, if you will. They're, they're mm -hmm. the ones that are hardwired, that are, you need to eat to survive, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really driving food seeking behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's how these systems evolved, is to ensure that you're balancing the risks of going out and foraging for food um, and potentially being eaten by a predator with the need to get enough calories to sustain yourself. Yes. And these days, we're fortunately, we're not um, being eaten by predators quite so much and food uh, is becoming increasingly, uh, in increasingly more abundant. And, uh, but those same biological drives are still there. They're just mm -hmm. acting now in a very different environment. Mm -hmm. So if we can tap into the, those pathways that are inducing us to go out and seek food and turning down that drive just a little bit. Um, I think that's how we can that's how we can probably have a, a greater impact. But yes, uh, the, the question is absolutely right. There's there's a multitude of, of different factors that that mm -hmm. are contributing. Mm -hmm. So uh, this nicely uh, now brings me to this question: uh, Is is it are the genes associated with obesity universal, or do we have like you know? Uh, variance due to, uh, let's say, ancestry or other factors? And have you tried to model this, uh, perhaps, you know, I, I, I've seen that with the IPSC, are, are you using like healthy kind of uh, from healthy individuals or have you tried to model from people with actual obesity? Yeah, yeah, um, obviously, uh, you know, you're, you're very correct in saying that it's, uh, for, for most individuals, obesity is, is, is complex and polygenic, right? There's not a particular mutation that can explain the obesity, mm -hmm. but there are, um, there are a, a contribution of thousands of, of genetic variants that may predispose some people um, or protect some people. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has been studied. So, uh, one of my colleagues, Sadaf Faruqi, has done a really nice study, not just looking at obese individuals and comparing them to, to individuals with normal weight, but doing the opposite, looking at individuals who are exceptionally thin, otherwise healthy, but are just very lean, hmm. and looking at their genetics. And it turns out there's a huge overlap, right? So a lot of the same genes that, if you regulate them one way, predispose people to obesity, helps keep some people lean, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that lean people are morally superior from the rest of us. It's just that they're not feeling quite as hungry. So they don't eat, eat quite so much. Um, but it's really, I think it's the combined action of many, many of these genes. And some of those genes are the same ones that you see in kind of these severe familial cases of obesity. Mm -hmm. um, not all of them, but there's enough overlap that that's telling us that there is some, uh, that, that we're kind of tapping into to the biology. I'm giving kind of a long-winded answer um, to, to the direct question, which was kind of what is what is my approach? How, how are we hoping to understand this? And I I think there's a lot more that's left to be discovered that that we don't know yet um, because of you know the of all of the mutations that we know are sufficient to cause obesity, they don't explain uh, mm -hmm. they only explain a very small fraction, right? Mm -hmm. So there must be more that's there. And we think that given how, given that these neurons within the hypothalamus play such an important role, that at least some of those other genes must be acting via those, via those cells. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to 
model the effect of those genes kind of one by one. Um, mm. that's, that's what we're hoping to do, for example, in these CRISPR screens. Mm. We're going to knock out those genes and see if they have any effect whatsoever. If they don't, we'll discard it. We'll say it's probably playing a role somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if it is changing the effect of, of, of those cells, then, then we'll dig a, a little bit deeper. Um, so that's the approach that we're taking, is keeping the genetic background the same mm -hmm. and asking which of these genes associated with, with common forms of obesity um, might be playing a role within the cell. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's obviously other approaches that one could take as well, but mm -hmm. this, this way of at least having kind of a common basis of comparison yeah. seems like a good way for us to start. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so have you, uh, there's a question, have you tried to use brain organoids to model obesity? Yeah, um, I actually, uh, in the early days of, of trying to develop a protocol, to make uh, to make these hypothalamic neurons, I started with with organoids, mm. and it works. Like you can make hypothalamic cells, but it's variable, right? So that's that's one I think uh, weakness of organoids is that um, each organoid is just a little bit different, mm -hmm. and so it depends on what you're trying to do exactly. So if you are trying to make a large quantity of a particular cell type. Organoids are maybe not the way to go. If you, if it doesn't matter that you have many of that cell type, but you're really interested in studying, you know, organoids are known to maybe um, increase the maturation state of some of those cells, mm -hmm. um, or they allow you to look at interactions between between different types of cells. Um, if that's really important, then um, then maybe organoids are a good model system. Mm -hmm. So it is something that we've moved away from, but we're thinking of maybe moving. Um, back to, um, but the route by which we're moving back to them is, is, is kind of slow and controlled. So we want to make the different constitutive cell populations that we think are most important, you know, these POMC neurons um, and astrocytes. That's one thing that we're working on as well, which we think probably play a role in both metabolic sensing themselves, but also modulating the, the responses of neurons. Um, then we like to get to a point where we're also doing a, a microglial co-culture as well mm -hmm. to look at uh, to look at uh, inflammation. Yeah. Um, now that you mentioned that, so there are a number of things that I really like to hear uh, more from um, what you do. So in terms of the organisms, yeah. you did mention the issue of maturation. I do know that in the IPSC field, especially uh, for tau biologies, uh, the issue of immaturity has been an issue. So. Yeah. For your type of work, or for the POMC neurons that you culture, are, are they mature enough, or you don't really care because what you are really interested in doesn't have to do with um, maturity? Yeah, I mean it, it's a sixty sixty four thousand dollar question, right? It's a very it's a very important one, and as you said, kind of the whole field struggles with this. So really, we'd like the cells to be as mature as they possibly can be, but we have to accept a certain, uh, you know, that we have to accept that they're going to fall a little bit short of that, and hope that they're still sufficiently mature that they're going to be uh, that they're going to be informative. So there's a few ways that we're um, that we're approaching this. One is to improve the culture system mm -hmm. in which we're growing these cells. So we're playing around with different media and supplements, and we found something that is really uh, really gives us a much better cell type than, um, than what we've traditionally worked with and what is known in the literature. Mm -hmm. We're also doing these co-culture with astrocytes. Mm -hmm. That definitely helps as well. Um, and uh, kind of a third approach is going away from uh, directed differentiation and kind of having a hybrid approach where we'll pattern the cells to hypothalamus, but then use transcription factors to drive the production of, of, of different cell populations. Mm -hmm. And that work is still very preliminary, but um, one can at least accelerate this process of maturation a little bit. Mm -hmm. But we're always going to hit some barrier. We're never going to uh, mm -hmm. we're never going to get to a mature mm -hmm. neuron, uh, which is why I think it's really important not to focus on just a single model system, mm -hmm. but to confirm that in, in an orthogonal system. So that's why we have a mouse program as well, mm -hmm. so that we can take, um, if we have an interesting finding in culture, 
we really want to confirm using the mouse system that 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 is uh, that, you know, that 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 finding is relevant and uh, and and physiologically important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm liking it. Uh, I'm liking all the different responses, and we've got two uh, extra questions. So I'll try to see how we can, uh, you know, round up. I know you're gonna leave soon. Um, so uh, the next question is uh, from Frank. It said, "Nice presentation. Thanks. I'm currently having a training in sleep medicine. I'm excited by this promising work. Obese patients with sleep problems can through this have a good alternative to bi uh, bariatric surgery." your comments so um i'm not sure whether frank wants you to comment on this but do you have anything to comment on yeah so i guess it's uh i am I am not delivering any cures at the moment. We're just one out of many, many groups uh, around the world that are doing this type of type of research. Um, I hope that we can play a small role in um, actually having benefit to uh, to to patients uh, who who are suffering from obesity and and its its related morbidities uh, such as such as sleep disturbances. Mm. Um, that's that's definitely the goal. Um, but I can't say that we're quite there yet. So I, I can't take any credit for having done something for, for something that I have not yet done. Um, but, but I think that that really is the goal. And it's one of the things that, that drives me and that drives our group is you know, working on something that has the potential to really benefit people. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so Nidal has a question. It said, um, thank you for a great answer. Which are based on genes responsible for? Android shape that may associated with polycystic ovary syndrome. So um, I usually I try to restrain from asking questions that are off, but I, uh, because I'm not in the obese, uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether for the, this is directly relevant. If it is, if you could respond to it. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Is I do not have that, uh, that that knowledge on the top of my head. I'm afraid. Yeah, I think it's all right. Um, so, so I know we are running out of time. I'll probably ask you two last questions uh, for the audience um, if they would bear with me uh, because we have to round up. Um, so there, there is this interesting idea that obesity could be a kind of risk factor for Alzheimer's, uh, although you are probably not working on that, but. What are your thoughts on this? Are you thinking of perhaps looking at this kind of questions in the future? Yeah, actually, that is that is something that we are interested in and uh, have just started working on. Um, and we don't know what this mechanism is, but it is really just just to break down the evidence. So there's there's some epidemiological evidence that obesity in midlife is associated with dementia. There's this evidence from animal models mm -hmm. that if you calorically restrict its neuroprotective. If you give them a high fat diet, it accelerates disease processes. We, we don't really understand that very well mm. uh, mechanistically, but mm. I think it's an interesting question, even if it's a very fuzzy question. Mm. Uh, I think it's a very interesting and important one because we might learn about the factors that, that contribute to, to neurodegeneration that also arise in, in obesity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Again, we don't know exactly what it is, but some things that are shared are um, there's elevated in uh, kind of systemic inflammation that can mm -hmm. accompany metabolic syndrome. We mm -hmm. know that that's also seen in, in neurodegenerative disease. It's also things like uh, like ER stress mm -hmm. um, that can be induced in the brain just in response to diet. Mm -hmm. um, that also is thought to play a role in neurodegeneration. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of things that that mm -hmm. uh, you know one could at least experimentally test. Mm, um, mm. So, so we are mm -hmm. we are gearing up and doing this. We have some mice growing at the moment um, mm. in neurodegenerative models that we're putting on different diets mm. um, and hoping to treat with different drugs, targeting mm. metabolism yeah. to see um, if they're neuroprotective or not. So in nutshell, it could be that the Im impact uh, could be found to be indirect, probably due to the diet or something rather than directly due to uh, obesity associated genes or POMC stuff, stuff like that. 
Yeah, it's it's hard to know. I don't think that it's going to be quite as uh, easy to pinpoint a particular cell population, mm. but there might be some shared features yeah. that might actually be druggable, right? So if it's yeah. inflammation, if that's that's the main thing, there are things that we can do to reduce systemic inflammation. Mm. Um, and if that's what's responsible for this increased dementia risk in response to obesity, um, and we know that those drugs can be given safely for long periods of time, then that might be a good thing to do to high risk populations to reduce the likelihood that they'll get dementia. Yeah. Uh, so the last question is, um, I know you, we are running out of time. What advice would you give ECRs to uh, coming up, uh, you know, either completing PhD or doing postdoc? What have you learned through your journey that you want to share for people that are passionate about academia? But obviously we know that it's a bumpy ride. It is a bumpy ride. I guess there's many bits of advice, but one that I've really, I guess, learned over time is do something. If you can find something that you think is interesting and that other people think are important, you'll really set yourself up for success. If you're interested in it, but other people really don't care, you're going to have a hard time convincing <laughs> people that uh, they should give you money or that sh they should give you a job. But if you're doing something that other people are like, oh, yeah, of course, you should be studying that. That's an important thing. Uh, that's going to open up a lot of doors for you. And I'm certainly, uh, I guess the other, the other bit of advice is surround yourself by people that are smarter than you. And in my case, that's a pretty easy thing to do. And that really helps, right? I think collaborating with lots of people who have different sets of expertise, who, um, you know, sharing my knowledge, sharing my data, um, and helping build build networks um, has has really helped me get get where I am today. So, fantastic! I mean, this is really really helpful advice, um, and uh, I'm sure a, a lot of people watching this or who will come and watch this will find it extremely important. I like you said, you know, it's important to uh, think about what people think is good to follow that direction, but even if you like something, but people don't care. So that can be really hard <laughs> one to, to pursue. Um, so I guess uh, with this, we have to uh, end and uh, I would like to thank you for giving such a fantastic talk. Like I said, I would love to have heard more about the different aspects of the work, but hopefully in the future, we'll invite you to come and give us an updated version of this talk. Um, and to all the um, uh, audience that attended today, thank you as well for all the questions that you sent out. Uh, so thank you all. And uh, I, I would like to end the uh, seminar at this juncture. Okay. All right. All thank right. you, everybody. Bye.